So we're looking for the height and width. So let's do the easy one first. I think the height will be a little bit easier to figure out. So let's look at the height. I did my best to draw the height dimension, that vertical dimension back there. You could also measure the height in the front. It doesn't matter what side you measure it on. You can measure it anywhere in between. So let's think about how does the height change. What height do we have in the very first cross section? What is the height of the cross section on the far left? Zero. Now, if I draw the far right cross section, it actually will be a vertical line right there, and that'll have max height. And what the height over here is a little bit harder to see, so we need to know more about the shape of this wedge. So we saw the angle, which I I need a third color in here. We'll go with red. So I'm going to draw a line down the front like that. So this line right here will, this will help us with the height. So at this x value, you can measure the height right off of this vertical line, or off the diagonal line. So that is a visual guide for our height. So we're going to go from zero up to max height. So our cylinder, we see that the radius is three. So that is the measurement. If I write that measurement up here, our radius is three. So that, I feel like if I put a three here, it doesn't communicate the right thing. If I write that, that three down here. So we go over three. Now the angle, the reason I drew this red dashed line, I want to look at that angle. From the shape of this wedge, it said those two planes intersect at 45 degrees. So that angle that I just drew is 45 degrees right there. Now the importance of 45 degrees means however far you go to the right, you go that far up. This will be a isosceles triangle, even though it doesn't look exactly like that in the picture. So it's a 45 degree angle. However far you go over, you're going to go that amount up. I go over three, so that means I go up three as well. So I went three across, and I go three up, because the angle is 45 degrees. So our height goes from zero to three, when our x value goes from zero to three. So let's write a height function. So it's a linear function. At 0, we have 0. At 3, we have 3. So it's a linear function, mx plus b. I know that h of 0 equals 0. h of 3 equals 3. So I know my slope and my intercept from that information. So what is the intercept? 0. You plug in 0, you got 0. And our slope, when I go over 3, I go up 3. So rise, uh, rise over run will be 3 over 3. So our slope will be 1. So h of x, our height function, is just the x value you're using. And this should make sense when you look at the graph here. I did my best to write the height in a meaningful way in the red pen right there. So you can see it starts at 0, goes up to 3. So there's our h of x function, and we'll write that as just x. Now I need to find the width. So we have the width. I'm going to go back to green. Oh, we already did the width. Yeah, we're pretty much there then. So we got x times 2 square root 9 minus x squared, and that is our a of x. So we got our height and our width, and we just put this into an integral. So this is our volume. Formula uses that somewhere up here. So we're using this volume formula. So all we did was compute the area of a cross section, A of x. So go back to the black marker. So all that green was basically geometry stuff. 
So our actual volume will be integral a to b, area of a cross section dx. So our a of x is 2x square root 9 minus x squared dx. And for a and b values, those are minimum maximum x values. So we'll go back to our drawing. We got our x-axis right there. What is the minimum x value? Zero, and we go all the way out to three. So we're going to go from x equals zero to x equals three. So this integral looks a little bit tricky. From our techniques in chapter eight, what does it look like a reasonable move would be? U sub x squared. So not quite. So we could do it try u sub, but it looks like a trig sub. However, you don't have to go trig sub. So let's write down the trig sub that would work. There's three choices. Which trig sub do we want to use? Which one? Cosine. So that would be x equals, uh, well actually this time it will be three cos theta because you have that nine there. Dx negative three sine theta d theta. I don't have to go trig sub here. So u sub will be easier. When u sub works, it's generally the easiest way to go. So I'm just going to label this as difficult or the scenic route. It will work, and it's good trig sub practice. So let's forget about the scenic route. Uh, let's go with the u sub. What u sub will work? Almost. 9 minus x squared. Nine minus x squared. So du negative 2x dx. I have almost everything perfect except the negative sign. So get that negative to the other side. I got the 2x. I just don't have negative 2x. So it's negative du equals 2x dx. And to make that u sub. We got negative square root u du. And our endpoints disappeared unless you want to convert them into u's. So do not write 0 and 3 because those are x values, x uh, corresponding to x values, not u values. So this is negative integral u to the 1 half du. How do you integrate u to the 1 half? So that's the power rule or the anti-power rule. So you want to be careful. Log works when u is raised to what power? Negative one. Negative one only. So negative one is the only power. The antiderivative will be a log. There could be other tricky ones, like if you remember an integral of tangent or no secant. There's some that a log sneaks in, but that's because you make a u sub and you're looking at one over u, or u to the negative first. So we just add one to the power. So 1 half, we got 3 halves, and divide by the new power. This is not a good time to mess up adding 1, or mess up by dividing by something that's not the new power. So this is negative 2 thirds. u is 9 minus x squared to the 3 halves power. And because we're back in x's, I can write the 0 to 3. Uh, I forgot to write my vertical bar here. It's a good idea to keep your vertical bar even though you're not putting endpoints on it. You, you know you need to fill in endpoints on your uh, when you unsub. All right, so plug in three, plug in zero.
So any algebra questions, arithmetic discrepancies? So these cross-sectional areas are probably the toughest problems from chapter six. So I want to warn you about that. In my opinion, they're probably the most difficult out of chapter six. What we're going to do next is we're going to look at volumes, of course, but we're going to look at volumes that are obtained by rotating a curve or rotating a region. And the good news is when you have a rotational solid or a solid formed by rotating, your cross section are always circles. So that's why the uh, rest of the problems in 6.1 and 6.2 are nice, a lot nicer, because they're all solids of revolution. So they're much, the cross sections are easy to compute. Doesn't mean they're easy to draw, but the cross sections are uh, relatively easy to compute. You just figure out your radius, and it's, you know, pi r squared. So that's what the next part of this section is called, solids of revolution. And the one we're going to use first is uh, the disk method, which fits in with the making slices. There are other names for this. Totally blanking on the other names. I think they call it the washer method. We're going to learn the shell method after this, or the cylinder method. But for now, we're going to this section. We're going to do the disk method. And this goes along with cutting, we're cutting cross sections here. So let's look at how to make one of these. So begin with the region. So we'll have some graph y equals r of x, and whatever that graph looks like, let's just pretend that in this example, it just has some curve like this. And of course, we're going A to B. So we need a region. So we will fill in all the area under the curve right here. So this whole thing is shaded in. And what we're going to do next is rotate this or revolve this. So you can extend this line. And we're going to revolve about that axis. So all you want to think about here is um, cooking your rotisserie chicken. You just keep rotate all the way. So you don't want to burn it. So rotate all the way around. What shape does that make? This is going to look sort of like a chess piece or something like that. So we're going to rotate this thing around. And how to draw it, the way I like to draw it is I keep bringing my axis over. I'll draw my rotated solid over here. So I copy the exact curve over once. Do the best you can. And then you copy a mirror image, like it's rotated exactly halfway around. So we go from um, on the top and then rotate it halfway down to the bottom. You can also think of ref reflection. So try to draw the same shape, except the mirror image. I can do better than that. If you're on graph paper, this is actually relatively easy, because you can pick a couple nice points and then kind of sketch between those. I'll try to do the same thing here. Uh, good enough. So once you have this shape, so you have two copies of the same shape, you just connect up with circles, basically. And it's up to you how many you want to use. I like to draw one 
periodically. Sometimes you can draw, you can draw more than one if you want to, but try to make this thing look like it's three dimensional. And if you want to make it look even nicer, you can make your back, let's see, medium eraser, make the back dotted. Like that, so it looks like there's actual back uh, part of that curve. So there's our solid of revolution. And that is a very nice way to draw the revolve solid. Just go two copies of your original curve and then try to make it look three dimensional. So we're cutting with cross sections. There is exactly one direction to cut, one way to have your plane cut through that gives you a nice cross section. There's an infinite number of bad choices. So what are some bad choices? What if we slice with the plane this way? We're going to get some really weird shapes. Some parts we cut through, we'll get two pieces. Some parts we'll get one. And they're going to be, I don't really want to draw one. I don't know, it looks like vaguely triangular and then maybe oval over here. I don't know how it's going to cut through. But that's a bad way to cut the shape up. What plane should I use to cut this into nice regions? So vertical, so relating to our rotating rotation axis, so this is our axis of rotation, what you want to do is go perpendicular to your axis. So you want your plane to be perpendicular to your axis you're rotating. So we're going to slice through vertically with planes like this. I didn't really leave myself much room to cut with the plane, but that's OK because I've already drawn the intersection of this plane with this region. And it is this circle right here is what we're going to get. So when I cut through, no matter what x value we use, it's going to be a circle. Maybe a slightly bigger, slightly smaller circle, but it's going to be a circle. So any questions about that plane making that cut right there? All we have to do now is figure out the area of this slice. And like I said, it's a circle. So it's going to have a very nice formula. So just like before, area of a cross section. I'll redraw the cross section here. And the only measurement I really need is a radius. If I can get the radius, what is the area? So if you know r, what is the area of a circle? Pi r squared. Pi r squared. All right. So area is going to be pi r squared. So all I need to know is r. Let's take that radius measurement that I just drew. We'll draw it on our solid of revolution and then redraw it on our original. So here's the radius on our solid of revolution. And if we go back to our original, let's see, I drew it on the low point there, so it's somewhere right about here. So there's our, oh, it's kind of hard to see. Is it bad on the board? Well, you probably don't, are not drawing with the pink. I don't think I can erase that mess that I drew there. Well, maybe I can. Oh, that was easy. All right, so any questions on that measurement going back to the original? So R is a function of x. It's that function of x. There's nothing more to it than that. The radius is the original height function. That's it. So it's our original function that we graphed. So radius is 
the original function that you graphed. So we can write our volume formula. So you take your original function, you square it, multiply by pi, and that's the area of your cross section. So this is a good time to stop before we actually get into a problem. So I'll put a box around this guy. So we'll be using this formula.